Right, so we got a test tomorrow. Nobody likes tests. So let's try to make sure that we know exactly what the test is on. All oh, right, we learned about the periodic table. And I can't remember a thing about it. Okay, okay, okay. Don't worry, let's not panic. We got ourselves a periodic table. So let's break it down and learn piece by piece everything we need to know about the periodic table to prepare for this test. Let's see. Okay, the periodic table and the elements that are on the periodic table are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. Simple enough, all right, that's basically all we need to know. So let's move on to the actual elements themselves. Let's start with the metals. Metals lose electrons to form positive ions, also known as cations. Most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. In fact, two thirds of the chart are made up of metals. The metals are found, in, are found to the left of the staircase, except for hydrogen, because hydrogen is a non-metal, but it's on the left, but it's not a metal. Oh, and the most active metal found is in the lower left of the periodic table, which is FR for francium. Going along with metals, we have our properties of metals, which include metals having a metallic luster or a shine, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, and they're malleable or have the ability to be, to be pounded into sheets. Oh, they're also ductile, which is having the ability to be bound, pounded into, into thin sheets. All right. They have low ionization energy. Metals also have a low electronegativity, and electronegativity is the thing that measures the attraction of an atom for a shared pair of electrons, which can be found on table S. And finally, solids at room temperature. All metals are solids at room temperature, except for mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature. So we got metals done. Now let's move on to nonmetals. Nonmetals gain electrons to form negative ions, also known as anions. Nonmetals are found to the right of the staircase, and about one third of all the elements are nonmetals. The most active nonmetals are found in the upper right hand corner, but don't forget that the noble and inert gases do not count due to the fact that they are inert or non reactive. So, exclu excluding the noble gases, most of those most of those nonmetals in that area are active, or the most active to be precise. Properties of nonmetals include the fact that they're dull, they're brittle, they're poor conductors of heat and electricity in all phases, they have low melting and boiling points, they have a high electronegativity as well as a high ionization energy, and finally nonmetals can be found as solids, liquids, and gases. An example of a liquid is bromine, and an example of some of the gases are all of group 18, hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. And they are all found as these phases at room temperature. Moving on to the metalloids, metalloids have properties of metals and nonmetals. Metalloids actually border the staircase. For example, boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, germanium, and antimony border the staircase because they are metalloids. For groups 1, 2, and 13 through 18 on the periodic table, elements within the same group have the same number of valence electrons, although helium is an exception, and therefore those groups have very similar properties. Let's go transition into some of the groups. Beginning with group 1, also known as the alkali metals. Alkali metals have only one valence electron, and these are the most reactive metals in any period. They exist as compounds in nature, and are never found uncombined. Alkaline metals are obtained in their free state by electrolysis in their molten salts, and they react violently with water to produce hydrogen gas. Group 2, also known as the alkaline earth metals, have two valence electrons. They're active metals, but not as active as group 1 in the same period. They exist as compounds in nature, never found uncombined, just like group 1, and they are obtained in their free state by electrolysis of their molten salts, also like group 1. We're gonna just skip over all the way to group 17, also known as the halogens. 
Halogens have seven valence electrons. They are the most reactive nonmetals in any period. And they contain elements in all three phases of matter. So at STP, fluorine and chlorine are gases, bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a solid, due to increasing van der Waals forces. And finally, they exist as compounds, or salts, and they're never found uncombined. Group 18, also known as the noble gases as mentioned earlier, have complete valence shells, except for helium. Helium has two valence electrons, the rest have eight. Noble gases are not considered reactive due to having complete valence shells, and they exist as monatomic gases. And finally, the larger noble gases can bond with fluorine, for example, xenon hexafluoride. All right, let's backtrack, because we missed some things. Those things are the transition metals, Groups 3 through 11 consist of transition metals, and they form colored compounds in solution. And they also have multiple oxidation numbers. Alright, now that we got all the stuff on the periodic table itself over with, let's move on to some let's move on to something different, but also necessary for, you know, that test tomorrow. So what is the atomic radius? Well, first off, before you panic, the atomic radius is listed on table S right here. So in a period, the atomic radii decreases due to an increase in nuclear charge. In other words, the atomic radii decreases because more protons are pulling tighter on the electrons. While in a group, the atomic radius increases due to an increase in the number of principal energy levels. Next up, we have the ionic radius. The ionic radius is not on table S, so don't bother looking. And it's as simple as knowing that metals lose electrons to form positive ions. Therefore, their ionic radius is smaller than their atomic radius. For example, Na plus one is smaller than Na because it lost one electron. Another important thing to know when talking about the ionic radius is that nonmetals gain electrons to form negative ions. Therefore, their ionic radius is larger than their atomic radius. For example, fluorine negative one is larger than fluorine because it gained one electron. Oh right, electronegativity. Electronegativity is listed on table S. Electronegativity measures the attraction for electrons in a chemical bond. So the higher the value, the stronger the attraction. So in a period, the electronegativity increases because there are more valence electrons and there's a stronger attraction for electrons to complete their valence shell. While in a group, the electronegativity decreases because the atoms are larger and it's easy to lose than gain electrons. And here we have first ionization energy, or just ionization energy. Ionization energy is listed on table S right here. Ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to remove the most loosely bound electron from a neutral gaseous atom. So in a period, the ionization energy increases because there are more valence electrons. Therefore, they are less likely to lose electrons. While in a group, the ionization energy decreases. Oh, it... well, it's not written here, but uh, editing. The ionization energy decreases because the atoms are larger and it's easier to lose electrons. Here's something different. Metallic character. Simple enough. In a period, the metallic properties decrease so non-metallic properties increase. While in a group, the metallic properties increase, so non-metallic properties decrease. Here we have a group of elements known as the diatomic elements. They are structured as so. And the diatomic elements include hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and oxygen. And all in rainbow colors. And just for fun, the diatomic elements form a seven on the periodic table, as shown here. Ooh, I think we've reached the end, but before we do, let's talk about allotropes. Allotropes are elements that can exist in two or more forms in the same phase, and allotropes have different chemical and physical properties. For example, carbon can be graphite, but could also be diamond. They look completely different, as their physical properties are completely different, and their chemical properties are also completely different yet they consist of the same element. Also, another example is O2, can be seen as oxygen, but it could also be ozone. Once again, completely different chemical and physical properties. 
well, that was a lot of information to take in, wasn't it? <laughs> Definitely quite a mouthful to say. I mean, look at all this information that we have to know. I honestly don't really know what else to say at this point. So let's just hope that we all do well on our test tomorrow. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you.